All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Astronomy on Tap 2020 season. My name is Patrick Mullen. I am a fifth year graduate student at UIUC's Department of Astronomy. I'll be your host this evening. Today we have a fantastic speaker for you, Professor Paul Ricker. Paul Ricker has been an astronomy professor at the University of Illinois since I believe 2002. Uh, he is a computational astrophysicist whose research work involves building computer models. And some of these computer models are even run on some of the largest supercomputers in the world. And he uses these models to simulate interacting binary stars and galaxy clusters. But I learned something new about Paul this year. Until recently, I would have imagined that Paul in his free time might be somewhere with his nose stuck in a computer coding up his next state-of-the-art astrophysical simulation, or potentially uh, dreaming up his next homework problem to torment graduate students. However, I guess my expectations were uprooted. In mid-July, I was trying to think of a cool socially distanced uh, activity and decided that it might be fun to go to the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society's Observatory and look at, if you might remember, Comet Neovice, which was almost visible to the naked eye. Thinking that I would be the only person there, I was surprised to see Paul there himself with a laptop plugged into a telescope taking the most beautiful images of the comet. In fact, his telescope put my setup to shame. I believe that this hobby of Paul's is what might have motivated the conversation he'll be sharing with us tonight. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Paul, who will be talking to us about photographing the deep sky. I'll be monitoring the YouTube chat throughout the talk. Feel free to ask any questions. I'll interrupt Paul during the talk if I, if I find the opportunity. Alternatively, you can save your question until the end. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> and uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for tuning in. And I, I hope everyone's as, uh, as well as can be expected this year. Um, this is uh, a photograph I, I took from the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society dark site, uh, four miles south of town of uh, the Trifid Nebula, which is a popular subject. Um, it's uh, uh, a star forming region. There's a, a region where there's ionized hydrogen, that's the pink, and the blue is reflected light from, uh, from bright young stars. And, uh, and this is in the constellation of Sagittarius, which is up in the summertime, which would have been around when I was taking some of these frames. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll discuss how some of the basics of how uh, we take pictures of the night sky and give you some insight actually, not just into the hobby of astrophotography, but hopefully also into the, um, the science of observational astronomy. So uh, uh, like, uh, like some other uh, areas of, uh, of activity, um, the, uh, the pandemic has uh, led to uh, problems with supply chains and increases in demand uh, if you've tried to buy a bicycle this year, you would know that it's virtually impossible. Um, the same is almost true of telescopes. Um, and, uh, and in fact, yes, this is, uh, this is partly because of uh, supply chain issues that, uh, that have been interrupted because of the pandemic, um, but also um, because people are looking for things to do. And, um, and so they've bought up the available stock. So it might be hard to actually find a telescope if this, uh, this uh, presentation motivates you to do that, but, um, but I hope that, uh, but, uh, that you're, uh, you know, that you sort of maintain a, a, an inst inspiration to look up and, um, and look through another telescope uh, if you get the opportunity um, before too long. Um, there we go. So, so astrophotography, like regular photography is actually, a variety of different kinds of photography. And, um, and these different kinds of photography all have different sort of unique requirements. Um, most of what I do is what's called deep sky astrophotography, where um, these deep sky objects are uh, also known as faint fuzzies, are things like nebulae, those gas clouds, um, galaxies, uh, star clusters, sort of extended objects that, um, that may cover uh, some large region of the sky, but are typically very faint. Um, if you want to take pictures of planets like uh, Saturn or Jupiter or, uh, or Mars, which has been a really popular subject this fall with the uh, Mars opposition, um, that, that requires somewhat different, uh, different types of techniques because um, the planets are very small on the sky. And, uh, but they're very bright. And, uh, and so really there, what you're trying to do is instead of, uh, 
uh, looking at faint things, you're looking at bright things that um, that are obscured uh, by the um, uh, turbulence in the atmosphere. Uh, solar eclipses, um, comets, ISS transits, International Space Station transits, all involve uh, different things uh, such as uh, high um, high dynamic range photography. Uh, they involve um, timing. Uh, that uh, you have to uh, automate a large part of your workflow uh, to do. Um, and landscapes are a very popular uh, mode of astrophotography, uh, also involving a lot of high dynamic range work where you have very faint background sky and, um, and brighter, uh, brighter foreground uh, subjects. So I'm gonna focus mostly on deep sky objects, and, um, but I can answer other questions about some of these other uh, areas as well. So, uh, so the fuzzies are indeed faint. Um, so this is a, a picture of a pretty widely recognizable uh, constellation that's visible from most of the world, Orion. And um, in uh, a month or so, it'll be uh, up in the uh, evening sky. And, um, and you'll recognize, hopefully, uh, well, maybe, maybe you won't. Maybe this will be the first time you're learning it. Uh, this is uh, the star Betelgeuse, uh, whose dimming this year we were very int intently focusing on because uh, people were wondering whether it would lead to a supernova explosion. This is the star Rigel down here. And this is Orion's belt with his sword. And uh, down here, the famous Orion Nebula, which we'll look at later. But this is what you would typically see if you um, had dark adapted eyes and you'd gone to a dark site to, to look at the sky. Um, but your eyes are, um, because their sensitivity is really geared more toward daylight vision, um, your eyes are not sensitive to pick up everything that's there. If you were to take a telescope and look at this region of the sky, and let's say expose for 200 hours, this is what you would see. There's a huge amount of uh, interesting astrophysics going on here. This is Barnard's Loop, an old supernova remnant, uh, the, the Orion Nebula, the horse, uh, the horse head, uh, all kinds of uh, gas and, and dust here because of star formation that's going on. The Rosette Nebula, another uh, set of uh, star forming regions and, uh, and what are called H2 regions, ionized hydrogen clouds. Um, down here next to Rigel, there's something called the Witch's Head Nebula, which is, um, which is being blown away by, uh, by Rigel's uh, wind and, um, and illuminated, reflecting, uh, showing reflected light from Rigel. So this is just a fantastic image and a lot of work went into uh, taking this image. But, um, but this shows you what's actually there in the sky and you just can't see it because of, um, because of the sensitivity of your eyes. Um, now, a lot of times people think of telescopes as being really for magnifying things in the sky, but, um, but as we'll see, re really they're, they're, they're for amplifying the sky. Um, they're, re they're really for collecting more light than you can pick up with your eye. So you could sort of think as, of uh, light as, um, there, there are various ways of looking at light and various ways it behaves in, uh, in physics experiments. Um, but, uh, but one way of looking at light is as a collection of particles called photons that move at the speed of light. And so really what we're doing in taking a picture of the sky or of your friend at the park is, um, is to collect photons. Um, and um, and the, in, the in the daytime, you know, there are lots, of, lots and lots of photons. Um, you know, it's, uh, the subjects are bright, it's very easy to get enough light. But when you're taking, taking pictures at dusk or taking pictures at night, um, even of subjects that in the daytime would normally be uh, would uh, be pretty bright by reflected light uh, will be very dim and there won't be many photons. So uh, so if we have a, a celestial subject like a, a gas cloud, let's say, we, we're basically seeing photons coming to us from from a single point in the sky or from small, small angle in the sky. And um, and although I've drawn the, the lines from the, uh, the cloud is coming off sort of at, at uh, coming emanating from a point here, they're really almost parallel uh, because of the very, very great distance from, from these objects. Nevertheless, if we had a, a collection of, uh, of photons coming to us from some distant cloud like this, the more area we have to collect those photons, just like collecting raindrops, um, the more photons we would collect in a given amount of time. And here, here's an eyeball down here, and you can see that the, uh, the human eyeball's pupil is pretty small. But if you compare that to 
a, a telescope aperture, uh, right? You're collecting more photons, more raindrops, uh, be, just because the aperture is bigger. So, so you can really think of a telescope uh, not so much as a magnifying device as a as a light bucket. And there are different kinds of light buckets. Um, there are well, there are basically two categories depending on how the uh, light is collected and, and amplified. Uh, one kind is um, it, it uses lenses; those are called refractors, and the other kind uses mirrors, and those are, for obvious reasons, called reflectors. The very first telescopes were refractors. That's what Galileo used to see uh, craters on the moon and sunspots on the sun, um, the moons of Jupiter. Um, but not too long after, um, in the 17th century, Isaac Newton uh, invented the uh, reflecting telescope. And, and the reflector has some advantages over the refractor. Um, but for the first couple of hundred years, most of the um, most of the really sort of research grade instruments were uh, were refractors, and um, the way these work is uh, if you've got a and again uh, I've I've indicated these uh, rays of light coming off of one of these stars, for example, as emanating from a point, but you really have to think of this these stars as being really really far away so that the light rays are effectively parallel when they're coming in, but they're coming in from some particular direction. And what the, um, what the telescope does is it takes all of the rays that are coming from a particular direction, and no matter where they strike the surface of the lens, they get concentrated and directed to a single point on uh, the camera. And, um, and uh, since nowadays we have uh, digital cameras, um, there's an array of pixels, little uh, electronic circuits that individually uh, measure um, measure the, the number of photons that, that hit uh, each of those pixels. So, uh, so, that's, um, so, so you have to think of all of the light coming from this star that strikes any part of this lens as being brought to a focus here on, uh, at this point on the, on the uh, array. And, um, and so, uh, so really what this, this, this lens is doing is it's collecting all the light from this area, uh, the aperture of the lens. Uh, and uh, and putting it in one spot as if uh, as if you had an eyeball that was the size of the uh, of the lens. A reflector does the same thing, except uh, with a curved mirror. It brings um, it brings light rays uh, to a focus, and um, and of course because uh, you've got reflection here, the the basic problem is uh, what do you do with the camera or or your eye? Um, you, you know, that will need to be in the way of the light coming in. And so typically what's done is there's some mirror, uh, in the case of a Newtonian reflector, uh, there's a flat mirror that um, without magnification um, redirects the light rays up uh, into a, a sensor or your eyepiece and um, allows it be, to be detected. But um, otherwise the, the basic idea is the same. You're concentrating all the light that's, uh, that's falling on the aperture of the telescope into a single point on the telescope, on, on the camera. And, um, and any of these other points of, of light, these other stars here, other objects in the field of view, um, will have their light also redirected and, dis and uh, concentrated on a different point on the imaging array. So, so telescopes are light buckets, but of course they do also show us different regions of the sky. And so there's a second concept that's important, and that is the idea of focal length. And um, the idea here is that if we've got, let's say we've got some stars, the blue star and the yellow star here are close together and the orange star is farther apart from those two. Any light rays that pass through the middle of the lens will uh, be essentially undeflected, right? They'll be deflected slightly when they come into the lens, but when they pass out of the lens, they'll be deflected in the opposite way. So at the end, they'll be, uh, they'll just pass through as a straight line. And so, um, so the distance at which uh, we have to bring um, the, the imaging array, the, the, the camera, uh, from, from the lens, that's the focal length, that's where we have to bring uh, to a focus. If it's a long way away from this lens, depending on the curvature of the lens, um, then, uh, then this angle that two points uh, on the sky will make in order to fall directly on the same pixel will be a pretty small angle. Uh, so a long focal length then will have a what's called a pixel scale. These pixels will correspond to a very small piece of the sky, and and typically 
uh, you know, these pixels will be in the microns and with the typical focal lengths that uh, amateur telescopes have, these might do maybe a few what's called an arc second of the sky. So an arc second is, uh, so an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree and an arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute. So it's a pretty small angle. And um, a short focal length, on the other hand, if we've got a short telescope and the focus uh, is pretty close to the lens, then this angle will be larger because there's a smaller distance needed to travel here. And, um, and, so, uh, and so we'll see this orange and the yellow star in the same pixel here with this short focal length telescope. So a short focal length telescope uh, looks at a large area of the sky. And, uh, and typically, if you're getting into astrophotography, um, it's better to start off with a short focal length telescope uh, because um, uh, any errors in tracking, I'll get into tracking later, but uh, any, any errors in that or any jiggling of the telescope or any um, uh, oscillations in the, you know, turbulence in the, in the Earth's atmosphere that will interfere with the clarity of an image will be significantly less for a short focal length. Uh, than it will be for a long focal length. Okay, so that's focal length and that's aperture. And, um, and that's really kind of like the, the, the basics of how a telescope works. Um, are there, I, maybe it's a good point to stop and see if there are any questions about that. So I can't see the chat, Patrick, if you need to, you need to call those out if there are questions. Yeah, so uh, we are on a little bit of a delay, so I don't see any questions quite yet. Uh, but I can ask one really quick. Okay. Uh, so, so you said that uh, a short focal length is better for a, uh, a beginner, an amateur uh, astrophotographer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to see things that are more uh, zoomed in. So why, why wouldn't I want to go to a, a longer focal length? Well, you can see things that are zoomed in by using a smaller sensor. Um, uh, even with a short focal length, uh, because uh, the angle here that um, this pixel scale is determined not just by the, short, the focal length, but also by the, the physical size of the pixels. And the, the, the smallest pixels available on most uh, amateur level uh, telescopes are, are something like, uh, our cameras are, are about uh, 2.4 uh, microns, something like that. Um, larger uh, pixels could be as large as even 10 microns. Um, and, um, and really kind of the expense of a camera goes like the, the number of pixels more than the, um, more than the, um, the size of the pixels. Uh, so, so if you wanted to see, oh, but, but the, the thing is though, even if you used a short focal length and a small sensor, the smaller you made the pixels, the more you would be sensitive to, um, to things like seeing like the, um, the, uh, uh, turbulence in the earth's atmosphere and errors in, uh, in tracking. So it's, um, you can certainly start with a longer focal length, but the, um, but the thing is you'll, you'll wind up with more sort of technical frustrations that might drive you out of the, uh, out of the activity than, um, uh, than if you started off with a shorter focal length. Thanks, Paul. And we have one more question. Uh, okay. Paul, could you briefly talk a little bit more about aperture? Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the, we, it says that I know it's preferred to have a lower aperture, but I think I missed the exact reason. This is coming from Natasha. Uh, 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 it's better to have a big aperture. In fact, you would like the biggest aperture you could possibly have. The problem is that the weight of the, uh, of the instrument goes up. And, um, and so this is actually one of the reasons. So if you look at old pictures like of Herschel uh, looking through a telescope in the 18th century, um, in, in those days, uh, uh, the preferred instruments were typically very long focal length refra refractors. And um, partly because they, they weren't as good at making um, uh, optical elements as we are today. And, um, and it's easier to make a long focal length refractor than it is a short focal length one. Um, but, uh, as, uh, as time went on and people started to make bigger and bigger instruments, um, the, uh, the weight of lenses gets large enough that they actually sag under their own weight. So, uh, a telescope like Yerkes uh, up in, uh, in Wisconsin, which has a, is a refractor and I believe it's a 40 inches. It's about a meter telescope is about the largest practical size refractor that I think has ever been built. And um, 
the thing with reflectors is it's possible to buy, uh, uh, you know, you, obviously a big chunk of glass is a big chunk of glass, regardless of whether light's passing through it or light's reflecting off a silvered surface. But you can drill holes in the back of a, a reflector uh, of a mirror and not affect its, um, its optical qualities. And uh, with the very largest telescopes on Earth, you can actually make multiple mirrors. You can make separate mirrors that can be separately adjusted through actuators to create a single optical surface that can span, in the case of the Keck telescopes, 10 meters, far larger than any refractor could be made. So, uh, so typically telescopes these days would be reflectors. And, and as at the professional scale, at the uh, amateur scale as well, you would want typically the largest optical element you you could you could handle uh, but two things right one is the cost goes up two is um, the weight goes up and um, and, and so those are both things to, to consider uh, you know people say that uh, for example a, a telescope or a camera for that matter that you don't take out is one that's uh, you know that wasn't worth spending money on. Um, so uh, so if you buy a very large telescope but because it's so heavy and awkward to set up, you know, it's um, you, you want, might have been better off getting a smaller one. So people get small telescopes. The other thing is that because the human eye, if you're if you're using this for visual, um, then the human eye only integrates light over a short period of time. I forget what it is, like you know, fra small fraction of a second. But we can take a camera and let it park on an object for a long period of time, maybe even uh, well, typically in amateur astronomy, it might be uh, fifteen or thirty minutes at a time. And, um, and collect a lot more light that way. And then the aperture doesn't make as much of a difference. So there are a bunch of different things that one needs to consider. And I'd say that probably um, uh, of all these different parameters to vary, if one is getting into this, uh, this hobby, then, um, then the focal length is probably the thing to, that's most important. Okay. All right, thanks, Paul. I think we're ready to move forward. Okay. All right. So, uh, so uh, some I promised some pretty pictures. So here's a uh, here's a very popular target. This is actually an object you can see with the naked eye if you're in a dark enough place. This is the nearest galaxy like the Milky Way, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy M31, Messier 31. Uh, the Messier catalog is a rich uh, collection of different objects to look for. Um, it was uh, first created by Charles Messier in the uh, 17th century uh, because uh, people were looking for comets. It was a very hot research topic at the time. And they found all these faint fuzzy things that weren't comets and those are boring. So let's catalog them so we know not to be distracted by them. Well, uh, things are a little bit different now. Comets are still interesting, but we're very interested in these other things as well. So M31 is, um, is about the size of the full moon on the sky. So that's a good sort of way of calibrating your, your sense of, um, of what a degree is on the sky. And, uh, and so uh, the full moon is about half a degree or 30 arc minutes. And that, that is about the same size as the center of the Andromeda galaxy. Now Andromeda is, um, is the kind of target that you can, uh, you can photograph even with uh, a, a regular telephoto lens um, on a on a DSLR and um, and in fact lots of people do this. This is a this is a great one to to look at uh, originally or when you're starting out. And um, in this particular case, I um, I used a, a specialized camera um, that's that's actually cooled to increase the sensitivity of the uh, of the um, uh, of the chip and uh, and a small telescope. Um, but um, and, and I'll, I'll show a little bit more about that in, in a bit, but, um, but this is a sort of a sense of one of the most popular sort of wide angle um, uh, uh, objects to look at. And, and of course, if you can find your way to a, a very dark site, it's really cool to be able to see uh, uh, with your own eyes an object that's 2 million light years away. Uh, here's another object. Uh, this is uh, the Ring Nebula, M57. It's in the constellation of Lyra. And uh, um, it's um, it's more up in the summertime. It's um, it's uh, it's up now still, but um, but it'll go. Uh, it'll be less visible uh, as the year uh, winds to a close. And M57 is an example of what's called a planetary nebula, you know, a, a star that's 
a low mass star like the sun um, that's less than about eight times the mass of the sun uh, will not be will not achieve densities and temperatures in its core that are high enough to fuse anything beyond um, beyond helium. And so what will happen when the sun uh, reaches the end of its uh, its lifetime is that the core will be uh, left behind as a carbon oxygen, very, very dense object that's held up by um, by a quantum mechanical effect called degeneracy pressure. And uh, in the process of, um, of reaching that state, it will blow off its outer layers uh, into uh, a nebula, uh, what we call planetary nebula, which unfortunately, although the name sounds like it's associated with planets, has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with planets. And, um, and this planetary nebula will, it's basically the guts of the star uh, apart from the core that have been blasted out into space. And then because the core is extremely hot, like 100,000 degrees hot, it ionizes that gas and makes it glow for, uh, for some period of time, tens to 100,000 years or so. So, uh, so this, is, um, this is a stellar corpse basically. And these stellar corpses are very, very beautiful, uh, very popular. They're relatively bright, but they're very small. And so the size of this on the sky is about four arc minutes or one fifteenth of a degree. So, so this is getting, this is something that you can still use a, a, a small refractor like I talked about to get, but, um, but this, tells, this uh, image was taken with a larger telescope um, and um, I'll, I'll show that in a bit, but um, this is a, an eight inch telescope uh, based on a design called Ritchie Chrétien. And it's, um, it's basically the same design as the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's a, it's a reflector. So that's a smaller object. And then um, another really small planetary nebula um, that I've, I've been trying to get, and I'm sort of, this is not my best picture, but, um, but it's about the best that I was able to do with this object. This is the Cat's Eye Nebula. And, um, and this, is, um, this is small enough now, this is only uh, about 20 arc seconds across. And so this is small enough now that the effect of atmospheric seeing, atmospheric turbulence, is um, is a major uh, difficulty in capturing um, in capturing details here. And so you have to use a, a technique that you use for uh, for capturing pictures of planets called lucky imaging, where you take lots of lots, I mean like thousands of really short images, maybe a um, hundredth of a second or tenth of a second, and um, you stack them together. Uh, taking only the best ones. So at the very, at the, just the lucky moments when the atmosphere was momentarily still, you get a clear picture. And so, uh, so lucky imaging is needed for these objects. For the larger objects like the Trifid Nebula, which I showed, you still stack together pictures, but you take longer exposures. They might be a minute, five minutes, 15 minutes is usually the longest that I take. Um, and, um, and you might do that for several hours and stack together pictures uh, that are, they're called sub-exposures, each, each of which is maybe a minute long. And I'll get into why you do that in a bit. So, um, so the other thing besides, uh, uh, besides having the ability to capture light uh, is, um, is the need to track. And uh, so, so of course, when we take a picture of uh, a person on the Earth's surface, we don't need to move the camera around. We just need them to stay still and we take a picture and we go on our day. But if we're taking pictures of things in the night sky and we're taking pictures that are long exposures, um, the Earth rotates and it makes the sky appear to rotate around us. And, uh, and this is actually a, an effect that's exploited uh, in wide angle astrophotography to make beautiful star trail pictures like this one from um, the Atacama Desert in Chile. But, um, but you can see if you compare this uh, 360 millimeter focal length, my, uh, my little telescope with my bigger telescope that's got a 1600 millimeter focal length and take uh, one of my cameras that's got uh, this frame, you can see that uh, if you're looking at Jupiter, that in the short focal length, Jupiter moves, appears to move across the frame very slowly, but it is moving. Whereas at the long focal length, you're looking at a much smaller piece of the sky. So, so Jupiter really kind of zips across. So if you were not to track, if you were to just set up a telescope on a tri or a, um, a camera on a tripod and take a picture without trying to follow the Earth's rotation, um, you would get a streak. Anything longer than about, uh, well, it depends on the focal length, but, um, but if you have a short focal length, anything longer than about a second will lead to a streak or so. So, uh, so this is an important consideration in taking pictures of the night sky. 
and um, and uh, there are various ways of dealing with it, which I'll, I'll get into some solutions later on. But the most important thing, and this is maybe even more important than the quality of the telescope you have, is uh, having a steady mount. Uh, and there are different kinds of mounts. Um, the cheapest for a big telescope is something called a Dobsonian reflector. And, um, and, and for this, for a few hundred dollars, you can actually get a, a, a telescope that's got an aperture that's several inches wide. It's uh, usually a reflector. And, um, and these Dobsonians, uh, they move, they're, they're what's called an altazimuth mount. They, uh, they rotate uh, in, a vert in a horizontal plane and they, uh, they rotate in, a, sorry, yes, they rotate this way and they rotate this way um, horizontally and vertically. And, um, and uh, so they're, they're great for, uh, for visual use, but they don't typically track. It is possible to turn these into uh, something that can track, but it's, um, it's, it's typically not something that's with them. Now, uh, the other two kinds of mount that are used in amateur telescopes are equatorial mounts and alt azimuth mounts, altitude azimuth. And I have an example, if you could um, have my screen here or shift the screen over, uh, Chris. Um, this is an example of, a, um, of a, a, an equatorial mount. And the idea here is that one of these axes points toward the north pole of the sky so that when you, um, when you rotate around it, oops, wrong axis, when you rotate around it, you're basically staying parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. And um, the other axis is perpendicular to that. And so it allows you to move north and south on the sky. So, uh, so if I pick a, a direction on the sky and then have a motor that moves me only along this axis, I actually uh, track, well, I would probably be going this way, I would track the Earth's rotation. Right? So these tracking equatorial mounts are really necessary in order to take long astrophotography and do long astrophotos. But, um, uh, but there are, are, are inexpensive ways to do that um, that, I'll, um, that I'll get into. An alt azimuth refractor is a little bit easier to understand. Sometimes the equatorial, refract, uh, or equatorial mounts uh, are a little bit confusing to people. An alt azimuth is a little bit more intuitive. Um, and it is possible to track with those, but as, the, as an alt azimuth uh, telescope tracks across the sky, it actually, um, the field the, of view that it has will rotate slowly um, as the, as the uh, uh, telescope tracks. Most important though, whether it's a tracking telescope or not, is that the, um, the tripod or whatever mount be really, really stable. And in fact, a rule of thumb is that um, the mount have a capacity that is twice the weight of whatever it is that you're putting on the mount. Uh, so that's why, for example, a professional telescope like the four meter Blanco telescope in Chile, which um, uh, is, uh, be, has been used for the dark energy survey, of which the University of Illinois is a part, um, has this really, really beefy mount. It's, a, it's an example of a fork mount um, but it's basically an equatorial that's, uh, that's sized appropriately for a four meter telescope. So it's important to keep steady. Now, uh, the final thing to consider is, uh, is um, integration time. Now, if all those photons were, and, and the reason why I have this red uh, camera here is that I have this, um, uh, this uh, camera that I use a lot, but um, uh, if all the photons coming into the camera we're sort of like an army that were marching in rows. Then, uh, then we would open up the uh, the shutter and uh, and accept photons in, and and when we close the shutter, all the pixels on the on the camera's uh, uh, array would have exactly the same number of photons, and it would be a uniform background, right? We'd get a smooth image like this. But in reality, the processes that create these photons are not synchronized in any way. They come uh, at random times. And so if we open the shutter and then close the shutter, some pixels will have uh, some more uh, light and some will have slightly less, even if the intrinsic background is completely uniform. And, um, and this noise uh, goes down as a fraction of the total uh, like the square root of the number of photons or uh, alternatively as a square root of the amount of time that you spend. So if you spend four times as much time, you reduce the amount of noise by a factor of two. 
And so you get a noisy image that looks like this. So one of the uh, important things in astrophotography is to try to beat down the noise. And the way you do that is by exposing longer or by stacking together, adding together uh, the um, images, shorter images uh, that uh, are of the same part of the sky. So there's a uh, there's kind of a uh, an, a digital analog to the um, the process that photographers used to do in the dark room with uh, chemical photography and you know lots of carcinogenic chemicals you do now on your computer and um, and uh, this digital dark room involves a number of steps which I've just really simplified here it can take some time to, to, to sort of master this and, and come out with details. But just like with daytime photography, there's a lot of potential for changing the different, tweaking the different uh, steps of this process and coming out with different results that, um, that have some artistic uh, merit to them. And so, um, so the idea here is that you take a number of these sub exposures and you stack them together. You may subtract a, what's called a dark frame that, um, that captures just the response of the camera to um, the same amount of time, but no, no signal, just dark. And you stack them and then you get, uh, you get a complete image, but it's very, very dim. It might be disappointing when you first look at it. Um, so what you need to do then is stretch it because your screen has actually got um, a pretty limited dynamic range compared to both your eye and also compared to the, um, uh, to the camera. And so, uh, so by stretching it, you take uh, the very dim parts of the image and you make them brighter while trying to keep the brightest parts of the image about the same brightness. So you, 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 you bring up the dark parts and you keep the, the bright parts about the same. And so you get something that looks like this, which is noisy, um, but now you can start to see the details and it's like, wow, you know, I've got a real picture coming up now. Now uh, there are various things to be done uh, to, for example, sharpen the image, make uh, details more, uh, more apparent. Um, and then there are various algorithms that you can apply to reduce the noise even um, beyond the, the noise reduction that you got by, um, uh, by taking a lot of sub exposures. So you do noise reduction. And then finally, if like with this camera that, um, that I have here, this is, <clears throat> this is a monochrome camera that, um, that has a wheel in front of it. Each, uh, each, each location on the wheel has a different color filter. And so I can take uh, different images that have different colors and then combine them together. And then this combining of colors to make a final image is another way in which um, you can get very different results. If you look at uh, look for uh, any of these astronomical objects online and look uh, look at images like a Google image search, you'll find that lots of people have had different interpretations of these objects. So uh, here's another popular object. Um, this is um, th this is actually uh, an image I took or a set of images I took um, on a visit down to the Everglades last uh, last New Year's Eve and um, uh, and uh, it's actually a little bit difficult. This uh, the Orion Nebula is a star forming region in the constellation of Orion. It's in Orion's um, sword and. Um, uh, and it's got a really bright central core. These four stars here are called the trapezium and they're, um, they're blowing out, they have gas, uh, sorry, they have uh, winds that are blowing out the gas and dust around them and uh, evacuating this region. So this, re this area has uh, all kinds of very, very young stars and star forming uh, clouds uh, that uh, are being affected by the radiation from these stars. And you can see one of the one of the cool things from these kinds of uh, these kinds of objects is the dust that obscures uh, some of the uh, bright gas that's coming uh, that's uh, that's behind it, and the dust lanes are part of the fun because they uh, they create a lot of the um, the interest the visual interest in the image. So we want to typically try to uh, capture the dust as well as the bright gas and um, and highlight the contrast between the two. Another uh, pair, well, so we've looked at the Trifid Nebula and this is sort of zooming back out with a, a shorter uh, focal length camera or telescope um, to take in another object called the Lagoon Nebula. So these are uh, again, both in Sagittarius, uh, something that you would be looking at more in the summertime. And in a really dark location, the, tr the Lagoon Nebula uh, is large enough and bright enough that you can actually just barely make out that it's there with your naked eye. So it's uh, it's another one of these things that um, that you can you can almost almost see without a telescope. And um, and all of this all of this the sand here in the background, 
those are stars because in Sagittarius, you're looking more or less toward the center of the galaxy and there are these huge star fields there. The density of stars is much greater than it is in the solar neighborhood. And, um, and it's really kind of humbling to look at these pictures and realize that every one of those two or three pixel objects on the, on the camera is, uh, is actually a star, is a nuclear reactor in space. Maybe there are planets around it. You know, maybe there's somebody on one of those planets looking back at you, but there are millions of them. Uh, here's another galaxy. Uh, this is M33 in the constellation of Triangulum. This is one that you can see now. And um, it's not as big. Uh, it's the sec. Uh, sorry, it's the third largest uh, galaxy in the local group of galaxies of which the Milky Way and Andromeda are a part. And one of the reasons why this galaxy is cool is that there is a an H2 region in this galaxy called NGC 604 that you can see very easily. It's very big. Um, as you can see, it's very pink. Uh, that's what uh, the hydrogen ionized hydrogen tends to make this sort of pink color. And, um, and you can see it all the way, uh, like three, uh, three million uh, light years away. So it's, um, uh, it's pretty cool that you can see these little uh, details inside a galaxy that, that far away. And you get a sense from each of these sort of how long it took me to get this level of detail uh, with this little telescope. So it requires some patience, um, but the results are pretty rewarding. Here's another object uh, I took uh, toward the, uh, uh, some of the frames uh, back when I visited the Everglades and some of them I, I took uh, earlier this month. Um, this is the Rosette Nebula. And this, um, this is another uh, region where there are some, a lot of young stars. It's a, a star cluster right here. And, um, and this star cluster, these bright stars uh, are very hot. And so they're blowing, again, blowing wind that, um, that evacuates this region in the core of, um, of, the, uh, of the nebula. And this, again, this pink gas here is mostly ionized hydrogen. What I've done in this case is to use a special kind of filter called an H alpha filter, which doesn't pass through anything except just a narrow range of wavelengths around this particular wavelength that, um, that uh, corresponds to uh, H alpha, the, the hydrogen uh, emission line. And, um, and, uh, and so that allows you to get, even on nights where, for instance, the full moon is out or you have bad light pollution from the city, um, you can still get great contrast in your, your images. And then I took uh, the red, green, and blue filters and combined them with a luminance filter that just covers all three wavelengths, all three, you know, the, pretty much all of the optical and uh, use that to get the colors of the stars. Here's another H2 region. This is just a piece of it now. This is something called the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. And, um, and this again is a region where there are lots of uh, newly forming stars. This, um, the Elephant's Trunk itself looks like uh, it's dark dust here in the optical. If you were to take a picture of this in the infrared, you would see that this is bright compared to a dark background. So, um, so there are lots of stars actually in here that we can't see because they're obscured by dust, but in the infrared, you could see them. Okay, so um, so clearly, uh, like photography itself, there's some uh, can be some money involved, and um, and, and uh, you know, sort of just an extreme example, you could even go online and buy yourself a, a um, this uh, Richie Chrétien telescope for two hundred thousand dollars. I looked at it more recently, and the cost had come down to one hundred and eighty thousand. So you know, that's quite a deal. Um, the, the thing that amazes me is that you can just click add to cart here and, uh, you know, do some major financial damage to yourself. Um, they say that uh, that computers allow you to make mistakes faster than anything except um, handguns and tequila. So um, so clearly the sky is the limit as far as uh, how much one can invest in this hobby. But it is possible to get into it and to get some nice results, even without spending a great deal of money. And so I'll, I'll outline three basic setups that, um, that where you can sort of get, uh, get a sense of what to do with that. The most simple setup is something called a barn door tracker. And, um, and for a barn door tracker, what you're doing is you're, uh, again, trying to follow the Earth's rotation. Um, but you, you can do it either with a, a manual, like you actually um, very, with a pocket watch, you're uh, taking uh, your hand and moving um, 
uh, dialing around so that you can uh, actually actually uh, crank this uh, this wedge open uh, or close depending on which direction it's pointing and um, and follow the Earth's rotation. And um, if you're very patient and very have good steady hands, that that can work. And um, <clears throat> it's limited, of course, in how long the exposure can be. And uh, it's really best for a wide angle, again, because of small tracking errors, you want to uh, minimize the impact that those will have on your image. Um, but you can build this for uh, not too much money using parts you can get at the hardware store. And if you have a, an SLR camera, even um, an old one that, uh, that you can find used, um, you can uh, you can mount that on this uh, barn door tracker with a photographic tripod and take some nice wide field pictures of the sky. And so there are various plans you can find online. This is a good book, a beginner's guide to DSLR astrophotography. It um, it has some examples of plans for that sort of thing. And you can get fancy with this. You can set things up where uh, there's a motor. You can even buy kits to make this this easy. Um, where there's a motor that's driving it instead of your hand. Uh, but it's um, it's still the simplest way to get sort of a tracking effect. Now uh, now it's possible to um, to get uh, uh, something that's a little bit more sophisticated, but basically does the same thing. Uh, that's um, a motorized sky tracker, and there there are a number of those on the market these days. These cost maybe two or three hundred dollars, and they mount onto a, a normal photographic tripod. They have a little a little telescope on them that lets you line up the um, equatorial axis with the uh, with the North Star that helps you um, uh, get that axis parallel to the Earth's rotation. But after you've done that, you can point the, the camera using this ball tripod in any direction you want. And again, it's best for short focal lengths. Again, you can even use, um, you could even use uh, just a normal camera lens for this. Um, and um, in principle, you could even use a, a, a smartphone uh, with the, an appropriate tripod mount. Um, the thing with smartphones is that they, they have very short focal lengths because they're meant for daytime photography um, of things that are relatively nearby. And, um, and so you can only really take very broad, wide angle pictures of the sky with those without some kind of special attachment. But, but you can use, um, use uh, a smartphone for this kind of thing as well. So that's like the next simplest thing. And then finally, the, the next simplest thing is to get one of these relatively inexpensive uh, equatorial mounts that in addition to being motorized may also um, have what's called go-to capability. That is, once you've gotten it set up and you've aligned it on some bright stars, you can tell it, I wanna look at M31 and it'll point the telescope directly there and then it'll start tracking it. So that's really convenient. Um, it makes it so you don't have to learn the night sky as, as much, but um, which can be part of the fun, but it can also be kind of frustrating if you're trying to find some really small thing and you just can't seem to find it by finding the nearby stars. So, uh, so go-to telescopes are, are, are great for, uh, for finding things, especially if you don't want to spend all night just, uh, just trying to locate stuff. And, um, and so if you pair one of these with a, a small refractor like this, um, this uh, and, and again, if you could sort of have the screen, this is um, this is the telescope I was talking about. This is a um, a sixty millimeter telescope, um, and I have a, an old DSLR attached to it. And the DSLR is attached to it um, using something called a a, a T adapter, and the T adapter screws onto the telescope, and um, and it has the the sort of bayonet mount. That fits directly into the camera, so it's a um, it's sort of a universal item that um, that is used to connect uh, uh, um, uh, regular photography cameras with um, with telescopes. Okay, so anyway, so that's um, and this cost me about uh, about three hundred dollars. So it's it's not cheap, but it's um, uh, but. Uh, as um, as astrophotography telescopes go, it's um, it's quite usable and um, and relatively inexpensive. And then again, uh, even a even an older um, uh, DSLR is more than capable of taking nice pictures. And then of course you need to power it. So typically you get uh, some of these little mounts will take uh, C or D cell uh, batteries, or you can use a 12 volt lithium battery uh, for those. 
and there are a number of these different manufacturers. There's something to, uh, to keep in mind with these small refractors, and that is that um, the ones made for visual use sometimes will, um, they're called achromats, and they, um, they're great for visual use, but if you point them at a very bright object, you'll see some maybe purple fringing around the edge, like if you look at the moon with them. And that's an example of what's called chromatic aberration. It's because the, the lens is not bringing all the wavelengths of light to the same focus. Um, that's typically something you want to avoid in photography. And so, um, and, and so uh, uh, telescopes made for astrophotography are generally what are called apochromats. They, uh, they are meant, to, they're designed with several lenses to, um, uh, to bring uh, more of the visual spectrum into focus at the same point. And so there are some manufacturers here that, uh, uh, that, that make pretty high quality um, apochromats that are relatively inexpensive. They're also manufacturers that make very high quality, very expensive ap apochromats like Takahashi, for example. Um, those will cost maybe thousands of dollars. These are, uh, these are all examples of um, uh, telescopes that may cost maybe hundreds of dollars. And then the mount itself, I think in this case, it went, it was about $300 as well. So this is probably the third cheapest and um, easiest way to get in. And, um, and it uses a, a, an application on a, a tablet to, uh, to control. So it's got a Wi-Fi uh, interface, so you don't even have to have the tablet connected to it. Now, one of the um, most important and most cost-effective things to consider is um, is a solution to the problem of how you focus. And I, I, got, I was very frustrated when I got into this at first because it was hard for me to get focus on stars. And um, the best way is to use something called a Bakhtinov mask, which was invented by a Russian um, amateur astronomer. And, um, and the Bakhtinov mask creates a diffraction pattern. It makes it so that um, light bends around the, uh, the little ribs in this, uh, in this mask and um, interferes with itself in such a way as to create um, a three spike uh, diffraction pattern. And if the camera is out of focus, then the middle spike will be offset. So it makes it extremely easy to see when you're in focus or not. And this, you know, you can make these, uh, you can cut them out of cardboard, you can 3D print one, or you can buy one that, you know, for 10 bucks. So, uh, so the, this, is, uh, this is really, to avoid a lot of frustration, I highly recommend the, the Bakhtinov mask. And, uh, and finally, then I, I mentioned the digital dark room. Um, uh, again, there's, uh, you, can, you can get into fairly pricey software to do this, but, um, but there's a lot of great open source software or relatively inexpensive software to do this with. Um, and here are some examples, uh, planetarium software to sort of figure out what to look at and where where it is in the sky, uh, like Stellarium, for example. If you're taking data and you have just a DSLR, uh, a lot of DSLRs, excuse me, have a built-in interval timer. Um, that works out great. Or you can get specialized software that you can run on a laptop and control the camera with. And then finally, uh, stacking and calibrating the frames is a popular tool called Deep Sky Stacker that will, uh, will do that. Um, and uh, another one called Astap, Astro, um, let's see, I'm blanking on the name here, but it basically will uh, will do something called plate solving. It'll take an image of the sky, figure out where it's pointing in the sky, and it'll do that with multiple frames and then stack them together. And then finally, for doing all the stretching and playing around with the uh, colors and the uh, sharpness and everything, um, the GIMP is a uh, is a popular open source alternative to Photoshop. So I've got like two slides here. I see uh, I see Patrick showing up. Okay, so uh, so one last, uh, two last considerations. One is where do you go, right? Again, if you uh, if you want to take pictures in a dark place, it helps to know where there are dark places. Um, there's a nice site called LightPollutionMap.info that'll tell you that clearly downtown Champaign is not the best place, but only a few miles outside of town, it's not too bad. Best place, of course, would be to go to Death Valley or something like that. Um, around here, we've got the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society dark site that's a few miles south of town. And then um, the Middle Fork Forest Preserve uh, in northern Champaign County is, uh, has recently become uh, an international dark sky park. And that is the darkest place in Champaign County. It's the only international dark sky park in the state of Illinois. Um, that is a, is a great place to go. 
And then finally, you want to know that the sky is going to be clear. And so uh, there's a nice website called astrospheric.com that, um, that does a sort of specialized weather forecast for, um, for viewing the night sky. It'll tell you the temperature, the dew point, you know, how humid it'll be, how, whether it'll be wind, uh, whether it be clouds, uh, whether the sky will be transparent because you can have a clear sky uh, but you have maybe smoke from wildfires, for example, that uh, makes it hard to see things. So, uh, so thank you all for listening. And um, I'll just leave you with a couple of books, uh, book recommendations. Um, these, are, these are really excellent books that go into more detail, include some of the mathematics and everything, um, but, but also explain things at a, at a really accessible level. Um, the Deep Sky Imaging Primer is uh, um, by Charles Bracken is the book I mostly learned from. And then um, if you're into using DL, DSL, DSLRs for astrophotography, there's uh, Michael Covington's book on uh, DS, DSLR astrophotography. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a marvelous chat. That was awesome. Uh, so we have plenty of questions coming in. Uh, so the first one I want to uh, I want to go to is uh, you, you, you've shown some different uh, price points somewhat, uh, but it seems like all of them at some level uh, require that you do sink some money in. So Natasha asks, is there anywhere in Champagne that you can actually just rent this equipment or, or use it while you are still learning or figuring out uh, what equipment you actually would like to invest in? That's a great, great question. Um, and the answer in normal times would be come to a COAS, a, a Champagne Urbana Astronomical Society, uh, open house or uh, University of Illinois Department of Astronomy open house, which are held every month at the University Observatory. And, um, and we have a number of these different kinds of telescopes and you can chat with people who are knowledgeable. Those are the best times. Unfortunately, of course, those are not going on right now. So, um, so that's kind of uh, a problem. Um, as far as renting, uh, you can rent astro uh, just normal photography equipment. And again, you could probably get by with uh, getting started um, with a, a nice, even a, a several generation old DSLR with a, a lens that maybe had a focal length of 100 to 200 millimeters, which is just into telephoto lens uh, territory, but not super into it. And um, and uh, those, uh, those are available for rent. Um, I think I remember there was a place in Chicago, I think that was Helix, uh, had uh, rental of photography equipment available. So, so that would be uh, one option if, um, if the, uh, the sort of open house type options aren't available. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, so our next question is asking about color. So how much are you lying to us about color when you are uh, showing us these pretty pictures? Uh, Amelia is asking, uh, what, what would it actually look like if I were to look with a naked eye through the telescope? Maybe we could talk about cat's eye nebula, for example. Yeah, well, uh, it would look gray. Um, and the reason is, uh, if you're looking through a telescope like one of these, and uh, the reason is that um, your eye has two sets of, uh, of cells in it, your retina, uh, some of which are, are color sensitive and some of which are not, but which are more light sensitive. And it's the, the rods that are not color sensitive that are active at night. So when you look through a telescope, if it's a very dim object, it'll look gray, which to be honest is part of the reason why I started taking pictures of things because I was, it was a little disappointing, right? I wanted to see the colors. And, um, uh, and uh, on the other hand, if you were to look through a one meter telescope with a, an eyepiece, if you had the opportunity to do that, you would probably see color that, that way. So it really depends on how much light the, the telescope can gather. Um, so I try as much as possible to make colors that I think are as uh, plausible as possible, but there is still some, again, there's some uh, artistic license available there. The most artistic license is taken by, and I hope I hope Galton the Ryan isn't watching, but it's uh, you know, it's um, it's done by narrow band astrophotographers, and um, and they combine uh, light from H alpha, typically H alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two are the most popular ones, but there are other uh, emission lines, and um, and those can be assigned to whatever colors you want. They can be mixed and matched, and there's a uh, there's a very popular palette called the Hubble palette which has produced all those beautiful Hubble images, those are probably the least realistic, I'm afraid, because one of the things that they do is they assign H alpha, which is a, a wavelength that's in the red part of the spectrum, 
to green, right? And so they show something that would appear to your eye as red as actually green. But, um, but because of the particular mix that they've chosen there, it really highlights a lot of the intricate tendrils and, and uh, interfaces between different parts of the cloud. And it, it's just great for seeing detail. And of course, they're just gorgeous pictures. So, um, so there's a good reason why people do that. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, there's that con to, to consider. And um, uh, anyway, yes. All right, so our next question is about the uh, telescope that we actually have at the University of Illinois uh, Observatory. So mm -hmm. uh, we have this historic uh, refractor telescope and uh, somebody's curious, how does that telescope actually compare to an entry level telescope? Um, so it's got a very long focal length. It's a 12 inch telescope. So it's, uh, it's pretty big as far as aperture goes, but it's also, I, I forget what the, um, the focal ratio is. Do you remember Patrick? I do not. Okay, so it's um, it, it, it's several feet. At least. I mean, it's like twenty feet long or something like that. So it's um, it, it it looks at a very small part of the sky, and so it would be great for taking pictures of small things, um, and uh, and people do like uh, like students will take pictures through it, um, but um, so in comparison with a, a little telescope like this, this has got a very short focal length. Um, the one parameter that people talk about is the focal length to aperture ratio or the F ratio. And this is what's called an F6 telescope, a fast telescope, because for the, um, the part of the sky that it sees, it collects light very quickly. Um, the, uh, the one in the observatory um, is really a slow telescope and is not ideal for astrophotography, even though it's got a bigger aperture. I see. All right, our next question is from Cassidy. Uh, what is your favorite object to, to photograph? Do you have a holy grail object that you either haven't gotten the chance to image or haven't been able to get a good image of yet? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, well, I'd say the cat's eye would be one candidate for that. I, I wasn't really completely satisfied with that image I took of it. And that was pretty hard to get. Um, uh, I love the Triffid Nebula. It's one of my favorite objects. Um, I've gotten a picture that I'm pretty happy with it, but I know I will go back to it again and again and take more of it. All right. And our next question uh, is asking about times of year. So you, you gave this uh, this website, I forget what it was called, to ast Astro, uh, what was it? Astrospheric. That's okay. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm curious, does the time of year actually affect uh, the, the conditions for uh, astrophotography? Absolutely. And will this website tell us about it? Um, it? Well, it'll tell you sort of an indirect way. It only tells you the forecast for the next few days. Um, but, um, uh, but in general, in central Illinois, the best time of year and as a combination of, um, of clear skies, of no mosquitoes, of low humidity is probably the fall. Actually, um, I seem to I seem to go out a lot more during the fall than any other time of the year. Um, the summer is great, um, but they're mosquitoes, and uh, the winter is also it can be good, although clouds are a problem. But uh, but when it's clear, it's really it's the the seeing is really good, is really sharp. Not as not like the Atacama Desert, of course, but it's the best that it gets here. And the problem is that it might be zero degrees, right? It's um, the best nights are the ones where you really don't want to be out. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, they're, they're different times of the year, depending on what you want to image uh, also plays a role. Um, so at this time of the year and throughout the winter, the galaxy uh, will be up. And, uh, and in the summertime, the galaxy will be up. And so you'll be able to see the, a lot of these, these beautiful, colorful nebulae. Um, in the springtime is what amateur astronomers typically call galaxy season, because you're looking mostly in the evening hours away from the galaxy's disk and toward, um, for example, Ursa Major, Ursa Major or Virgo, um, places where there are a lot of interesting galaxies. M51 is really, um, is really uh, a nice galaxy, the, um, the uh, Whirlpool galaxy, um, M101. So a lot of the Messier catalog galaxies are up uh, during the spring. And um, 
Globular clusters are our favorite target also. These are, again, uh, globular clusters, a lot, of, a lot of the galaxies are small things, so there would be things that you would need a longer focal length telescope for. The nebulae are really uh, things that often shine with uh, even long telephoto lenses. Uh, so we have a few uh, more questions. So uh, in one of your, in, one, in many of your slides, you put uh, uh, something that said aperture 60 ED plus ASI 183. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, we just want to confirm in the chat that this is the exact telescope plus camera combination that you use. Is that correct? It is, yeah. So the Apertura um, 60 millimeter, oops. Um, and uh, some of these telescopes are manufactured by the same manufacturer and then rebranded under different names. So like Astrotech, GSO, Apertura are all pretty much, a lot of them are the same. Um, some of them are Orion, Orion telescopes uh, are also pretty similar. Uh, some of them may actually be made by this in the same factory, just given a different name. So that can make it a little bit complicated to try to compare. But if you see that the specs are all the same, you know, like the size and the uh, focal ratio, and they look like they're similar, there may be small differences, like whether it comes with a finder scope bracket or a, a field rotator or things like that. But otherwise, it'd be the same telescope. So that's what this is. And then this, um, the ASI 183 is uh, a camera made by um, uh, a Chinese company called ZW Optical, ZWO. And um, ZWO and QHY are two of the uh, most popular uh, brands for astronomical cameras. This is the kind of thing which, it's an example of what's called a CMOS camera. Um, earlier generations of digital cameras for astrophotography uh, were based on CCD technology. And they would cost, you know, you, you might pay $10,000 for a camera like that. Um, this camera, uh, was a tenth of that, and this is, uh, and you can get decent cameras that are a tenth of that still. So for a hundred dollars, you could, or, well, that's maybe a little bit excessive. I'd say maybe two hundred dollars, you could get an entry level astronomical camera, not cooled, but um, but very sensitive and designed for astrophotography uh, from a company like this. Uh, Natasha asks. Is there any benefit of using a mirrorless camera? Hmm. Uh, yeah, actually, there could be, um, and that uh, that is that when the um, so when a, a normal DSLR uh, takes a picture, the mirror has to be flipped up, right, in order to expose the um, the sensor, and that flipping up uh, is um, a mechanical motion that uh, causes vibration. And um, you don't want vibration as much as possible. So a mirrorless camera, which doesn't require that, um, would be uh, would be an improvement on a normal DSLR. Yeah. And uh, last question. So what is coming up soon that you are really excited to image? Uh, for example, uh, James asks, are you planning to image the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction next month? Yeah, I, I thought I would try that. I, I, I have done, a, I've dipped my toe in planetary photography. I got some images of Mars. I was not a hundred, you know, you, you can compare them with what people who really, really are into planets uh, do. And I, I just felt like I wasn't up there at that level yet, but I'll try again with, uh, with Jupiter and Saturn. That's a broader, that's a wider field thing, even though they'll be close together. And um, I think that, that might be a fun target. Um, I'm also going to try uh, in the Horsehead Nebula uh, near Onotak is also over in uh, Orion's Belt is also a, a popular subject. And um, so I, I just recently bought this H-alpha filter, so I'm going to try it out on that. All right. Well, we hope to see your images, Paul. And I think that is a wrap for the seventh session of Astronomy on Tap. Everyone, let's thank uh, Paul very much for this uh, wonderful talk. And if you haven't already, please like our YouTube video. And if you uh, don't want to miss our next uh, talk, uh, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Everyone have an absolutely wonderful weekend and happy holidays. Bye-bye.